of an Egypt and Ethiopia. As you know, they've been fighting over the dam. Ethiopia built a dam with United States money, largely. It's one of the largest dams in the world, and it has one little problem. It doesn't allow much water going into the Nile River. So you can imagine Egypt's not thrilled because they, they, they live off the Nile River. The Nile River, it's its blood, its heart, it's everything. And uh, we think we have that one pretty well taken care of. But uh, that, was, that was a pretty bad thing. I, I was watching this as it was going up. I get pictures and satellites and everything. And I'm looking at this massive dam, and I'm saying, is that going to be blocking the water to the Nile? And anyway, that should have never sort of happened the way it happened. But financed by the United States of America, the whole thing is a little crazy. Somewhere deep in East Africa, the ground has just given up its biggest secret, a discovery so massive, so world-changing, that it threatens to shake the foundations of global power. This is not oil. This is not gold. This is the largest rare earth mineral reserve ever discovered, worth over $1 trillion. These minerals aren't. Just rocks. They are the lifeblood of modern technology powering fighter jets, electric cars, missiles, smartphones, satellites, and AI systems. And for the first time in history, they are in African hands and staying there. Within hours of Ethiopia's announcement, alarms went off in Washington, Silicon Valley, and Brussels. Defense officials were on the phone with the State Department. Tech CEOs demanded emergency meetings, because whoever controls rare earths controls the future. And right now it's not the West. It's not America. It's Ethiopia. Gone are the days of raw resource exploitation. No more cheap contracts. No more Western middlemen. Ethiopia is building its own processing plants, training its own engineers, and partnering with nations who respect its sovereignty. This is Africa saying we decide the price. We decide the partners. We decide our future. This discovery could derail the West's entire tech supply chain. It could make fighter jet parts more expensive. It could slow down 5 grams rollout. It could even threaten America's ability to compete in the AI arms race. And that is why Ethiopia's bold move is being called a declaration of economic war. Ethiopia isn't alone. China is stepping in with technology and funding. Russia is offering security and logistics. India is lining up too by future production. This isn't just an Ethiopian victory. This is a sign that the global south is rising and the west is losing control. For generations, Africa has been the resource pit stop for the world digging, mining, exporting wealth for pennies while the West reaped billions. But this trillion-dollar discovery is a line in the sand. No more cheap deals. No more silent exploitation. No more being told what Africa's worth. This is a message to the world. Africa will no longer just be the mine. Africa will be the factory, the refinery, the innovator, the future. And as Ethiopia takes its first step toward controlling its destiny, one question remains, what will the West do now that Africa holds the key to their technology, their economy, and their power? Because make no mistake, the era of cheap African resources is over, and the world is about to find out what that really means. Ladies and gentlemen, what you are about to hear is not just another story about natural resources. It is the story of how one African nation, Ethiopia, just altered the future of technology, global supply chains, and the balance of power for the next 100 years. Yesterday, under the blazing Addis Ababa sun, Ethiopia's prime minister stood before the nation and announced something that would send shockwaves through Washington, Silicon Valley, Brussels, and Beijing. The discovery of over one trillion worth of rare earth minerals buried deep in the heart of Ethiopia's Rift Valley. Not just any minerals, but the exact rare earth elements that power the 21st century. Neodymium, praseodymium, dysprosium, terbium, lithium. These are not just rocks. These are the building blocks of every smartphone, every electric car motor, every missile guidance system, every satellite in orbit, every 5 grams antenna, every wind turbine. Without them, the tech industry cannot function. And for decades, the West believed Africa would remain a passive supplier of these critical minerals, sending them cheaply to Western factories where real wealth was created. But Ethiopia just flipped the script and now the US is panicking. Reports from Washington say that within hours of the announcement, emergency meetings were held at the Pentagon and the White House. Tech CEOs from Silicon Valley were on conference calls with members of Congress, because this discovery threatens everything from the price of iPhones to the U.S. military's ability to build next-generation fighter jets. For years, the United States has depended on imports of rare earths from China, a country it has called its greatest competitor. But with geopolitical tensions rising, Washington has desperately been looking for alternative sources. They never imagined that one of those sources, perhaps the richest source yet, would be Ethiopia. But here's the real twist. Ethiopia isn't selling cheap. 
the Prime Minister made it clear that there will be no repeat of the old. Colonial model. Ethiopia will not be shipping unprocessed rare earth or two foreign nations. Instead, the government is building its own refining plants, its own processing facilities, and its own logistics networks. It is inviting foreign investors but on Ethiopia's terms. This is what has rattled Washington to its core. For decades, U.S. companies have relied on controlling the supply chain. They invest in extraction, then ship the minerals back to refineries in the West or Asia. That's where the real profits are made. Ethiopia just announced it will control the entire value chain from mine to market meaning U.S. firms will no longer dictate the price, and Ethiopia isn't doing this alone. China has already pledged billions in infrastructure support to help Ethiopia build roads, railways, and processing facilities. India is offering technology transfers. Russia has expressed interest in securing long-term supply contracts. This means Ethiopia is not just threatening U.S. tech dominance economically it is aligning with Washington's biggest global rivals to do it. Think about what that means. Every Tesla motor that uses rare earth magnets, every iPhone that relies on precision components, every missile, every fighter jet, every radar system that needs these minerals. The U.S. can no longer ignore Ethiopia. And this is not just about technology, it's about leverage. Ethiopia has just gained the kind of bargaining power that OPEC had with oil in the 1970s. In the coming months, Ethiopia could set global rare earth prices. It could decide which countries get supply priority. It could even choose to withhold shipments as a political tool. This is why analysts are calling this discovery a geopolitical earthquake. Let us be clear, this is not just Ethiopia's victory, this is Africa's victory. For too long, Africa has been seen as a supplier of cheap resources. For too long, we have watched our gold, our oil, our diamonds, our cobalt, and our coltan leave our shores only to return to us as expensive finished goods. Ethiopia has just declared, no more. And this is not just about minerals, it is about sovereignty. Ethiopia is asserting its right to set its own terms, to protect its own interests, and to ensure that its people not foreign shareholders benefit first. The West is already in panic mode. Media outlets in Europe are calling this a dangerous new alignment. Politicians in Washington are warning of strategic vulnerability. Lobbyists are pushing for emergency funding to secure alternative supplies. But the truth is simple. There is no alternative. Ethiopia holds one of the richest deposits in the world, and Ethiopia is no longer for sale. This is the start of a new chapter one in which Africa no longer just feeds the global economy but shapes I. The world is waking up to a reality it never expected. Ethiopia's trillion-dollar discovery was not just a resource announcement, it was a declaration of independence from centuries of exploitation. In the days following the announcement, the streets of Addis Ababa filled with jubilant crowds. Young Ethiopians waved flags, sang victory songs, and painted murals of their mountains glowing with rare earth treasures. Across the continent, from Dakar to Nairobi, African youth celebrated online, saying, This is Africa's time. This is our chance to rewrite the rules. But while Africans celebrated, Washington fumed. Reports leaked that a closed-door emergency session was held at the U.S. State Department. Analysts warned the White House that without access to Ethiopia's rare earths, America's green energy transition could be delayed by a decade. Defense officials warned that advanced weapons programs could grind to a halt. The message was clear. This was not just an economic problem, it was a national security threat. And how did Ethiopia respond? With strength and clarity, the Prime Minister stood before the world again and declared, For centuries, Africa has supplied the world with the raw materials of progress, only to remain poor while others became rich. This time, we will not be left behind. Ethiopia will process its own rare earths. Ethiopia will control its supply chain. And Ethiopia will use this discovery to build schools, hospitals, factories, and cities for its own people first. Those words were not just for Ethiopia, they were for the entire global south, almost overnight. Ethiopia became a magnet for international partnerships. China offered a $50 billion infrastructure package to help accelerate refining operations. India pledged to send engineers and technology experts. Even Middle Eastern sovereign wealth funds expressed interest in securing long-term contracts, offering billions in upfront investment. But perhaps the most significant development was what happened next. African nations began talking about forming a Pan-African Rare Earth Alliance. Imagine that for a moment, Nigeria with its Colton reserves, the DRC with its cobalt, Tanzania with its lithium, and now Ethiopia with its rare earths all uniting to set prices, manage, exports and control the global supply. For the first time, Africa would not just be a participant in the global economy but a price setter, a rule maker, and that is what truly terrified Washington. Within weeks, Western think tanks began publishing reports calling for urgent intervention.
Some voices called for sanctions, others suggested covert funding for opposition. Groups to destabilize Ethiopia's government, but Ethiopia was ready. The country had already signed mutual defense agreements with several regional powers. Russian advisors were on the ground helping secure the mining zones. Chinese-built surveillance systems were monitoring every movement around critical infrastructure. The message was simple. Any attempt to destabilize Ethiopia would be met with resistance. And here is where the story gets even more powerful. Ethiopia did not respond to U.S. pressure with hostility, it responded with an invitation. Addis Ababa sent a message to Washington. If you wish to benefit from our resources, come to the table as equals. No more dictates, no more lopsided contracts, no more extraction without development. But Washington hesitated. Its political class is not used to negotiating with Africa as equals. It is used to dictating terms. And so the world began to shift. Tech companies in California began signing direct contracts with Ethiopian firms. European manufacturers began building processing plants in Ethiopia rather than lobbying for. Raw material exports and Africa began to rise. Schools that had no electricity were suddenly powered by solar panels funded by rare earth revenues. Universities began opening engineering programs specifically for mineral processing and clean technology. Rural villages began receiving roads and clean water systems built with mining revenues. This was not just a resource boom, it was a renaissance. And as Ethiopia prospered, its neighbors began to follow its lead. Uganda announced new terms for its oil contracts. Zambia renegotiated its copper deals. Even resource-rich nations like Angola and South Africa began signaling that they too wanted to control their own supply chains. Suddenly, Africa was no longer seen as a victim. It was seen as a competitor. And that brings us to the final point, the conclusion that should shake every complacent capital from Washington to London. Africa has awakened. Ethiopia's $1 trillion rare earth discovery is just the beginning. Across the continent, new oil fields, gas reserves, gold mines, lithium deposits, and uranium reserves are being discovered. Every year. For decades, the West used these resources to build its power. Now Africa is ready to use them to build its own, and there is no going back. If Washington wants to remain part of the African future, it must abandon its old habits of coercion and embrace genuine partnership. If it does not, it will find itself locked out of the very markets it depends on. Ethiopia has thrown down the gauntlet not as an act of aggression but as an act of liberation. The Prime Minister's final words at the ceremony said it all. We are not asking for permission. We are not asking for approval. We are building a future in which Ethiopia stands tall and in which Africa is respected, not exploited. Those who wish to join us in this journey are welcome. Those who wish to stop us will fail. And as those words echoed across the Rift Valley, the world understood. A new power has risen in Africa. A power that will no longer bow, will no longer sell its wealth for pennies, and will no longer wait for others to decide its destiny. Ethiopia has lit the torch and now all of Africa can see the path ahead. After Ethiopia declared its plans to process and control its trillion-dollar rare earth minerals, a geopolitical storm erupted. The United States launched a flurry of diplomatic missions to Addis Ababa, trying to convince Ethiopian leaders to reconsider. But Ethiopia stood firm, refusing to be intimidated by Washington's so-called offers that were really thinly veiled threats. When sanctions were floated in Congress as a possible response, Ethiopia's finance minister delivered one of the most powerful statements of this decade. If you sanction us, you will sanction your own industries. If you block our access to your markets, we will sell to China, India, Russia, Brazil, and every nation that respects us. Ethiopia will not kneel because we hold the keys to the future and the future cannot be sanctioned. That statement sent shivers through Wall Street. Stock prices of major tech companies wobbled as analysts warned that any disruption in rare earth supplies could lead to shortages in semiconductors, batteries, and even military equipment. Suddenly, U.S. media outlets that once ignored Ethiopia were running 24-hour coverage on the country's dangerous rise. Headlines screamed about Ethiopia's growing alliance with China and Russia's quiet hand in Africa's mineral politics. But the Ethiopian people saw through the noise. They knew that this was not about global security, it was about who controls Africa's wealth. And this time, Ethiopia made sure its wealth would stay in African hands. Construction crews worked day and night building state-of-the-art refining plants. The government announced a special scholarship program to send 10,000 Ethiopian students abroad to study chemical engineering, geology, and advanced manufacturing. When they return, they will form the backbone of Ethiopia's new technological future. But perhaps the boldest move came when Ethiopia unveiled its national rare. Earth Sovereignty Act, which states, No rare air earth exports. All minerals must be refined in Ethiopia before leaving its borders. 
Mandatory local ownership. At least 60% of any rare earth project must be owned by Ethiopians or Ethiopian state-owned enterprises. Resource Revenue Fund. A national wealth fund will be created to invest rare earth profits in infrastructure. Education and healthcare not in offshore accounts. This was not just economic policy, it was a declaration of independence from the resource curse that has haunted Africa for generations, and Ethiopia's courage inspired others. Sudan, still recovering from years of conflict, announced new terms for its gold exports. Mozambique renegotiated contracts for its massive natural gas projects. Even historically cautious countries like Botswana began discussing African-controlled diamond certification schemes to rival Western monopolies. The shift was unstoppable. And while Washington panicked, the Global South celebrated. Latin American nations sent delegations to Addis Ababa, eager to form a joint rare earth supply chain. Network. Asian powers began talking about long-term African investment beyond just extraction building battery plants, chip factories, and research labs on African soil. For the first time in modern history, Africa was not a passive player but a global agenda setter. Yet Ethiopia knew that the fight was far from over. Western lobbying groups began funding media campaigns painting Ethiopia as unstable and a threat to global supply chains. There were even reports of cyberattacks targeting Ethiopia's mining ministry and financial institutions' attempts to slow down its progress. But Ethiopia was ready. Its new cybersecurity unit, built in partnership with friendly nations, quickly traced the attacks and shut them down. Officials went on live television declaring that Ethiopia would defend its resources both physically and digitally. This is not just about minerals, the Prime Minister said, this is about the soul of Africa. For centuries we have been told what we are worth. Today we decide our own value, and we will defend that decision with every tool at our disposal. And then came the moment that shocked the world. Ethiopia announced the creation of the African Strategic Mineral Alliance ASMA, an organization that would unite African nations with rare earth reserves to coordinate production, set, export quotas, and stabilize prices. It was, in effect, an OPEC for rare earths, Western government spanicked, calling it resource nationalism. But for Africans, it was justice. For too long, Africa's minerals have been sold for pennies while foreign corporations raked in billions. Now Africa would set the rules. Factories are being planned across the continent from lithium battery plants in Tanzania to magnet factories in Ethiopia so that Africa will no longer be just a source of raw material but a hub of high-tech manufacturing. The dream is clear. African-made electric cars, African-made smartphones, African-made satellites, and Ethiopia, is leading that charge. The final message to Washington was unmistakable. You cannot stop the future. You can either fight it and lose, or join it and share in a new era of partnership. The age of exploitation is over. The age of African power has begun. The world is watching. Ethiopia's trillion-dollar discovery has turned the entire global order on its head. The next decade will decide whether the West can adapt or whether it will fade into irrelevance as Africa, Asia, and the rest of the global South build a new world without it. Ethiopia's rise is more than a story of minerals. It is a story of dignity, of sovereignty, and of a continent that has finally found its voice.